Okay, hello, I'm Frank uh, from University College London and I work here just around the corner in the chemistry department. Uh, although not in an academic position, uh, but I did research in the past and today I want to talk about some of this research um, and how Julia helped me in this research. Uh, so the research topic is we want to simulate the quantum dynamics of small molecules. Um, why? For example, in spectroscopy, we want to um, calculate how the optical spectrum of a certain substance looks like, or we want to look in detail about how a chemical reaction takes place. So in theory, all we need to do is to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation uh, numerically, uh, and this will tell us how the wave function of the system evolves in time. Uh, now for such a molecule, this wave function is a function that depends on all the coordinates of the molecule. Um, this means it's defined on something called a configuration space. Uh, let me give you an example. So this is a molecule with five atoms. There are two oxygens and three hydrogens. Basically, this is a water molecule with part of another water molecule attached to it. Uh, this serves as a very minimal model for how a proton can move around in water. Um, and to describe the geometry of this molecule, we need a set of coordinates, for example, the distance between the oxygens and the length of the OH stretches. Uh, there are some angles in there and the bridging hydrogen can move around quite freely. So altogether, we have a set of nine coordinates, uh, which the wave function depends on. Uh, so it's defined on a nine-dimensional configuration space. Uh, and you th might think that space is big, but configuration space is bigger. Um, and the wave function is not the only high dimensional function that we need to worry about. Uh, we also have the so-called potential energy function, which uh, describes how the atoms interact. So this is also defined on this nine dimensional configuration space. Um, and to do any numerics, we need to represent these high dimensional functions as a chunk of data on the computer. And to do this, we discretize each of the coordinates, um, usually with somewhere between 100, uh, 10 and 100 points. Um, the problem is that for each additional atom in our system, we actually get three more coordinates. And that makes the configuration space grow really very fast with the system size. So let me show you some numbers. So let's assume that we use 20 grid points for each of those dimensions, and we store the wave function, which is complex valued uh, in double precision. Then with three atoms, uh, we have configuration space of three dimensions. We have a total grid of 20 to the three, which is 8,000 points. So you need 128 kilobytes of memory to store the wave function. With one additional atom, um, you now have six dimensions, and you actually need one gigabyte to store your wave function. You can still do that on a single computer. Going to five atoms, you now need suddenly eight terabyte to just store your wave function. So you need a bit more than one computer to treat that system. And with six atoms, you need 60-something petabyte of memory uh, for comparison. The, leader of the current leader of the top 500 list uh, has altogether about 10 petabyte of memory. So it becomes impossible to even hold your wave function memory, and we didn't really do any computation yet. So we need a more clever way, uh, a compact way to represent those high dimensional objects. Um, so we, we start with a function which is uh, discretized onto a multidimensional grid. And superficially, that's just a multidimensional array. In our example, that would be an array with nine indices. Um, but it actually has a more mathematical structure, actually, it's a tensor. And you might know a two-dimensional array is a matrix, and that's not just a grid of numbers. It has linear algebra structure, which is very useful and helpful. Um, and the same is true for tensors, which have additional algebra algebraic structure. And to show you how this can help to uh, cut down uh, to, to represent high dimensional objects uh, compactly, I will switch to a graphical representation. So for illustrative purposes, I'm now using an eight-dimensional tensor, which comes from uh, considering uh, eight coordinates, generally called x1 to x8, and still assuming we have 20 grid points per coordinate. Uh, then the tensor is represented by the circle, and each edge is one index of the tensor, which runs from one to 20. So altogether, we have 20 to the 8 elements in this tensor, which is like 25 billion parameters, which is quite a lot. And to cut this down, we use this algebraic structure. Namely, uh, for each coordinate, there is associated with it a vector space. And if we discretize coordinate with 20 points, then this vector space can be fully described with 20 basis functions. 
Now for a vector space, uh, there are many ways to choose a set of basis functions. And assume for a moment that you can find a set of basis functions which are ordered in such a way that they are uh, ordered by how much they contribute to this tensor. In this case, you can just keep the most important of those uh, basis vectors and throw away the rest. And that lets you re uh, <coughs> this lets you represent the tensor with much less data, namely you have just a bunch of 20 by 5 matrices for each of those, uh, for each coordinate, and a smaller eight-dimensional tensor with five to the eight elements. So altogether, that would be 391,000 parameters, which is already a strong reduction of the original. But and this, uh, this structure has been known for some time. This is called a truncated Tucker decomposition. And it can actually be much more further improved by applying this idea hierarchically. Um, namely, uh, if you look at x1 and x2, we have five basis vectors for each dimension. Um, and the combinations of those, there are 25 combinations, but maybe not all of those combinations are important. Maybe you only need to keep 10 of those. Um, and the same for other pairs of coordinates. And then you apply this idea recursively, and you end up with this structure, which is called a, a hierarchical tensor decomposition. And with the numbers here, that works out to just 6,200 parameters to describe this originally eight, uh, uh, our eight-dimensional tensor. Okay, so this is a way to compactly represent a high-dimensional object. Um, how can we use that in practice? Uh, so we have a wave function, um, and if we want to compute its time evolution, so we start with an initial state, and luckily, usually, this is already in this compact form. So all we need to do is force it to stay in this compact form. Um, if you use the regular Schrodinger equation, this will not happen, so you have to approximate that a bit, and there are algorithms which do that. If you use the Tucker decomposition for your tensor, then this is called MCTDH. If you use the hierarchical tensor decomposition, it's called multi-layer MCTDH. There are existing codes in Fortran which do all of this stuff, um, and it's very nice. But we also have to worry about another thing, which is the potential energy function. Um, and often this is given as a uh, fit to a large number of electronic structure calculations. Uh, so, and this, this is a complicated functional form which does not have this compact structure. Uh, so we need to convert it kind of. Uh, and there are also existing algorithms for doing that, which start by discretizing this function onto a grid. Uh, and then if you want a Tucker decomposition, you use the so-called higher order singular value decomposition. And for the hierarchical tensor, you use the hierarchical SVD. Um, but, uh, so this exists and works, and there's a problem that we need to discretize our function to the grid first, which is the problem we wanted to avoid in the first place. Luckily, um, this can be solved rather straightforwardly, maybe, um, because there's not really that much information in that function to begin with. So from, from an information theory perspective, it's uh, not necessary to evaluate this function everywhere. It's sufficient to sample it. And uh, my ex-colleagues in Heidelberg worked out how to do this with kind of subgrid sampling or Monte Carlo sampling to, to compute a Tucker decomposition. Um, and for the hierarchical tensor decomposition, um, well, you would need some kind of hierarchical SVD with sampling. And that's where I was at the end of 2013. And I wanted, we wanted to have that, but it didn't exist yet. So I wanted to implement it. And um, yeah, faced with the question, uh, which language do I implement that in? So uh, I had some requirements. First of all, it needs good support for multidimensional arrays. It should be reasonably fast because of a lot of data. Um, actually, how to do this exactly, the algorithm was not clear. So ideally, I want an interactive environment which lets me iterate quickly over the algorithm. Um, also, the algorithm will be quite complex. Um, so I want a language that doesn't get in my way and offers a lot of things already included. Also, personally, I, had, I was about to move jobs, so this is a side project, and I have to uh, very limited time to work on this, so I need something with good abstractions. And I can probably jump to the conclusion directly. Of course, Julia is the language which meets all of those requirements better than other languages. So I implement, implement this in Julia, and just briefly showing you how this Julia code fits into the scientific workflow. Uh, I come from a potential function given as a Fortran source code. I uh, compile it to a shared library 
I need some input parameters, how to discretize the grid, how to organize the tree structure, and uh, the desired accuracy, and then run, let Julia run its magic on it. I get a binary file, which is the hierarchical tensor. I need some more input files, input data, and then I run this quantum dynamics code, um, which uh, uh, then con consumes this hierarchical tensor, spits out a wave function and some output file data. Um, and just briefly show you some uh, results, uh, uh, which I run out of time, so I have to skip this, I think. Well, I just want to show, say that the Julia code runs really very fast on this single core of a laptop, uh, and this really enabled us to um, run this quantum dynamics calculation much more efficiently than was previously possible. Um, so experience with Julia, just quickly run over it. Really, the most important thing is uh, we have an interactive, uh, the interactive REPL is really great for exploratory programming. Um, I had some gripes which mostly have been taken care of nowadays. Probably the biggest gripe is still that uh, compilation times are still quite long. And just briefly want to mention I have a work in progress package which should eventually do this uh, hierarchical tensors um, for arbitrary multidimensional errors or functions. And well, thank you for your attention. One feels inspired. Okay, so you, oh, sorry, there was one? No. So I was thinking, so you relate a, a higher dimensional space to searching in a tree of, of the dimensions one by one uh, in one of your slides. It looks a bit like decision diagrams relating to integer programs. So uh, you're searching a high dimensional space by looking at the dimensions one by one. Have you found some sim similarities or? Um, I'm not familiar with those decision trees, so I, I'm not sure if there are any uh, analogies between those. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Yeah.